Good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this module two of the course Managing Risk for Post-COVID-19 Recovery. Module two looks at risk and vulnerability assessment and analysis. Part one of the module will be looking at risk assessment. The second part of the module will be looking at the vulnerability assessment. So what we aim to do in that module is looking at various approaches and techniques of risk and vulnerability assessment and analysis. If you would recall in module one, we, we look at the different terminologies and we've explained each one of them so that when we come to assessment and analysis, it makes more sense and we understand the different concept that we have used previously. So we will look at the techniques, the approaches that we use to assess risk and vulnerability. Why is it important to do a risk assessment? What are the limitations which we encounter when we perform risk assessment? We will give some examples of existing risk assessment approaches, the step undertaken in risk assessment process, then we come to the dimension of vulnerability. Why vulnerability assessment? What are the different dimensions there? And the examples which are used, mainly indicator-based approaches to assess vulnerability, whether it's at the level of household, at the level of the population, or at the level of the country. So even when we talk about risk assessment, vulnerability assessment, it could be at a micro, meso, and macro level. We should be careful here that the risk assessment, there are different ways of doing it, right? Uh, it could be that uh, it is done at the level of a firm. It could be it is at the level of an economic sector. It could be at a country level. So if you look at the existing literature, it's very, very broad. You can have different types of risk assessment or vulnerability assessment. In fact, there are many of them. So of course, it could be country specific. If you're doing the study at a country level, so you can have risk assessment or vulnerability assessment for your own country, where you will have indicators or dimensions which are pertinent to your country, yeah? And it depends on the specificity of your country, or you can do that at community level of a particular community or a particular region. So why risk assessment? We've talked a lot about hazard, about shocks, uh, about uh, stresses, but what we want to do is how do I evaluate? How do I assess the risk of these threats? So evaluating hazard is one thing, but at the same time, trying to minimize or remove the level of risk associated with the shocks is very important. How do we do that? Either by ad ad adapting coping measures, or adding other measures or policies in order to reduce the impacts. So we do a risk assessment because we want to identify how big the risk are at the micro, meso, and macro levels. And then what are the direct and indirect impacts of these shocks on communities and countries? We want to analyze the existing conditions of exposure to the, to the threat and vulnerability to the threat, whether it covers physical, social, health, environmental, economic dimensions, that will ultimately affect people, their livelihood, their assets, etc. So identifying how big the risks are, analyze the, the exposure and vulnerability of communities or people to these threats and evaluate the effectiveness of existing policies or strategies in place. 
And what can be done, of course, is there a need for additional measures and additional strategies to reduce the impact of the risk. So a risk assessment is important. The goal of a risk assessment is to answer these questions. What can happen as a result of the threat? Under what circumstances? What are the effects of these threats? How likely are the, are the possible impacts? So what are the possible impacts, effects? How likely will they happen? What is the probability of them happening? Is the risk controlled effectively of their measures in place, policies or uh, programs or infrastructure in place, let's say, to deal with that threat? Or do we need further actions? So these are the questions that we want to answer through a risk assessment. So we talk about having a risk assessment, the different dimensions or the different aspects that the risk assessment will want to look at. That is identify the biggest risk, right? It could be a risk specific to community, but it could also include systemic risk, which we referred earlier, and the related cascading effects. We also want to know within the risk assessment, what are the causes of this risk? What are the drivers? What are the factors that lead to this risk? Why do we need to know that? Because when knowing the causes of the risk, then the authorities, the government can adopt any measures, actions, or put in place resources to address the causes of such risk. The other thing that we need to know and why it is very important to have a risk assessment is that, like we mentioned earlier, not everyone will be affected similarly by the threat or the hazard. There are differentiated impacts. So there are groups of the population which will be, for example, more affected compared to other groups. There are vulnerable groups, maybe women, maybe young people, maybe elderly people, maybe the disabled, they are the ones who are vulnerable and they are more likely to be impacted by any, any shocks or stress. Then, as I mentioned, what is the capacity of your country or of your community to deal with that risk? We want to evaluate the existing capacity to manage these identified risks and the opportunities to apply further policies or to invest further to reduce the impact of the risk. Now, the risk assessment process, in order to achieve all these objectives we just mentioned earlier, in fact covers three important routes, three important phases risk identification, risk analysis, and risk evaluation. These are the three stages which are crucial in any kind of risk assessment. Of course, there are many types of risk assessment, as I mentioned earlier, and they can have more steps or you can, you can uh, uh, add additional steps to that or you can modify it in order to, to apply to a given context. In fact, we use the WHO 2021 uh, Comprehensive Toolkit for All Hazard Emergency Risk Assessment because I find it very explicit, very easy to understand. And if you have the data, you have the information, it can be applied. Of course, it depends on the country. Uh, specificity depends on the information you have and then the data you can have. So what is the, the risk assessment process of the WHO? It looks at identifying the hazard, which we mentioned earlier, 
evaluate the likelihood of the hazard happening, estimate the impact, determine the risk level, finalize recommendation based on that assessment, and then try to integrate these recommendations and actions in the national uh, action plan or sub-national action plan. So let's, we'll go through that step by step and explain each step. So step one is risk identification. So it's important for countries to focus on the relevant shocks, right? It should be that the hazard or the stress or the shock affect your country. So choose the relevant one. Then establish the negative consequences of such hazard. And when you look at the diff negative consequences, it's across the different dimensions, physical, social, economic, psychological, environmental. So the different aspects should be there. It should not be only economic or social, right? If you have data for the other components, then you should also look at uh, uh, the other components and have a comprehensive view or holistic approach to the different consequences. The impacts, as I mentioned, differ across population because those vulnerable groups will be more affected by, by the shock. It's also important to look at the consequences of these shocks in the short term, in the medium term, and in the long term. So if you look at the diagram there, risk identification, which is the first step of your risk assessment process, you need to identify the relevant hazard, look at the consequences. We'll talk about scale and exposure, ex who are exposed. Is it uh, the uh, women, young people, the most vulnerable segment of the population? The scale, is it affecting communities, a specific region? groups of people, household, etc. So this is very important. The risk identification step is crucial in the risk assessment process. Yeah, within that step, it's very important to look at exposure. Like I said, you should know the population as, at risk because then as, as the authority, as the government, you can design effective interventions and actions because you will know who are those communities who are more exposed to the shock. The scale and magnitude is also very important. That is, what is the intensity of that shock? Yeah, in which area it's likely to happen? How many people will be affected? what will be the impact so for instance if we take the example of cyclone what are the immediate consequences infrastructure being destroyed road networks school houses hospital uh, being in a bad state destroyed then you can't provide these services to your population but at the same time there are secondary consequences of cyclones like diseases um, food insecurity, lack of mobility, which creates greater vulnerability for certain groups of the population. So within risk identification, if I go back to the slide, we need to look at these four different elements there, which are crucial in the risk identification stage. The next step is to evaluate the likelihood. Now, to evaluate the likelihood, you need to have information, historical information related to a hazard. Yeah, the recent trend of that particular hazard, the frequency and seasonality. Frequency means in terms of the number of events occurring. Does that event occur regularly during the year or let's say every one or two years recurrent, or is it like it occurs every two or five years or five to 10 years? So what's the frequency of that particular event or hazard? 
Then the other one is seasonality. So we, in which period of the year the hazard or hazards are more likely to occur? For example, there's a higher risk of having cyclones around January to March. For some countries, you can have storm around October to November. I mean, this is just, we just want to know when during which period of the year it might actually happen. The level of occurrence almost likely to take place, that is the shock will arise, let's say in the next 12 months with a probability of 90%, 95% or more. So what's the probability that it will occur? Yeah, is it high probability or low probability? So you need to have the information. You need to look at, let's say, post hazard historical information related to a particular hazard in order to know the frequency, the seasonality, the level of occurrence, which will help you evaluate the likelihood of that particular threat. The next one, and the next step is estimate the impact. So calculate the impact of the shock or stress. The risk analysis part should be based on data, especially quantitative data. And there are three components to that, to estimate the impact of the shock. Severity, vulnerability, coping strategy. All these terms have been defined in module one. So these three elements are important to estimate the impact of the hazard. The level of severity looks at the negative effects of the shock on the population, on, on let's say the health of the population and also on services provided to the population. The level of vulnerability looks at the current health status of the population at risk, right? the presence of vulnerable groups, environmental factors. The coping strategy looks at measures as to how people or communities or the country will adopt in order to manage the adverse conditions or the risk which are associated with these stressors, shocks or hazards. So what we did is we've split these three components in the diagram there. Assessing the severity, that is any kind of disruptions which are being caused to the population, disruption in, in essential food, in essential services like food, health, transport, uh, also consequences of, on the population in terms of uh, injuries, mortalities, mental stress, etc. Vulnerability, impact on vulnerable groups, whether they are uh, all age people, women, youth, people with disabilities, migrants, refugees, or people living in extreme poverty. So maybe with that threat or, or shock, they, they are facing a number of problems in terms of access to elect, uh, access to electricity, access to safe drinking water. So this makes them more vulnerable. Food insecurity, the health status, maybe they've lost their jobs, etc. Uh, reduction in income. So these are elements which can be used to assess their vulnerability. Uh, assessment of hazard specific coping strategy capacity is mainly the strategies which they have to cope with the consequences of the hazard. So financial resources uh, for emergency preparedness, for example. So there are a number of strategies at the level of the country, like in terms of national policies, national strategies, but also uh, policies or strategies at the level of the community or the household. So these steps are derived from the WHO 2021 toolkit for assessing risk. And they try to estimate an impact score where they use severity, vulnerability, and coping strategies. 
scoping capacity, sorry, the three elements which we've been looking at, and they do an average to get a score. And the score can range from one, which means negligible impact of that hazard, to five, which means critical impact or consequence of that hazard. Now, when you gather the data and you've been able to look at the different aspects that we've just referred in terms of vulnerability, severity, and coping capacity, then you can use the data of that risk assessment and present it in terms of a risk matrix. The risk matrix has two dimensions. One, it looks at likelihood of the event or hazard happening. And second, the impact of that particular shock, stress or hazard. The likelihood is whether it's likely to happen, very likely to happen, almost certain to happen, or very unlikely to happen or unlikely to happen. So there are different uh, possibilities. In fact, it changes, right? You can have a different uh, risk matrix with only four, four categories to explain the likelihood, or you can have more. So you can adapt it and change it to the context or to what you are actually analyzing. The impact could be whether it's negligible impact, minor, moderate, severe, or significant, or critical. Sometimes when we, we, we draw the, the risk matrix, you will see that likelihood is on the y-axis and impact is on the x-axis. So this can also change. You will see that in the second diagram on the right-hand side. The colors now, the colors will tell you how severe uh, a shock is and what's the likelihood that it happens and what, how severe is the impact, yeah? So when it's red, it means very likely and severe impact or likely and severe impact. So you will see high there in terms of the risk or it can be low, it's green, whereas high it's red, and then you will have different ranges in between them. So when I would give an example next, and you will understand better how we can see trade hazard threats uh, within a risk uh, matrix. So what we need to know is we have likelihood impact, and this can vary according to your analysis, and the colors will show the severity of the impact or to what extent this hazard will happen, will occur. So let's take an example. For example, if I take COVID-19, it was almost certain that this will spread to other countries, right? WHO already declared it as a pandemic and it was spreading across many countries around the world. So then critical, because then there were many deaths, many cases of COVID-19, which kept on increasing. So you will see there COVID-19, the likelihood almost certain and critical impact. Uh, basically for meningitis, almost certain severe. For cyclone, then you have very likely severe. So the severity, uh, when the severity changes, the color also changes together with the likelihood that this particular hazard will happen. So we have different colors to show. We can, you can include the different uh, hazard or threat which has happened to your particular country. And then you can situate according to you with the data that you have, with the information that you collected, where these particular threats or shocks can, can be included within a risk matrix, given the data information that you have. The step five is finalized recommendation. That is, 
you you have the information now about the risk it's likelihood and its impact you've collected data on on that situation of the hazard then you need to come up with actions right what will you do as as a government or as country or policymakers how will you put forward measures and actions to better prepare your country or your community uh, to hazards what are your priority actions one recommendation is that these priority actions should be based on the smart concept that is they should be specific they should be measurable they should be achievable they should be realistic and timely right so whenever uh, policy actions measures are being designed they need to abide to that smart concept which make it easier and you can have follow-ups as to what is being implemented and when step six is how to integrate these recommendation and priority actions into action plans so you need to integrate your recommendations into the action plan for the country or for a particular area so why do we need to do that because we need to know where to invest which resources to be to be used to achieve these uh, priority actions and recommendations put forward to better uh, be prepared to these threats so there need to be a planning in terms of short term long term medium term strategies and how you direct resources to implement these uh, strategies now this is the process these are the different information that we will be needing at different stages of the risk assessment process but it's kind of limited there are limitations there it would not be a perfect risk assessment because there is uncertainty you can't you can't anticipate all events and their potential impacts as well you can't quantify all the potential impacts of a hazard right so there is limited information you will also face important data gaps and information gaps and this is usually the case of many african countries we have a big data problem in many instances right and this make it difficult to measure risk and vulnerability so uncertainty is one uh, quantifying the impacts uh, is another limitation data gaps limited information also i mean our understanding of risk may differ yeah the definitions differ uh, the way we address risk also differ across countries and above that we have the systemic risk which are very difficult to manage and are very difficult to to measure because of a number of interlinkages and it's very difficult to get rid of systemic risk because all the system are linked also we can talk about uh a risk assessment for a particular country or community, reducing the maximum risk we can, but we can't reduce all risk. We can't reduce global systemic risk. It's very difficult to do that. So there will be limitations in the risk assessment, but this doesn't prevent us or any country to do a, a risk assessment, right? It should be there to better prepare countries, their population, to the potential impacts of hazard or any kind of threats. So this is part one of module two, which deals with risk assessment and the different steps uh, of the risk assessment process. Part two of module two will be looking at the vulnerability assessment. Thank you.